So I think in the beginning, it talked what we are going to try to solve is cases where our response variable is binary and categorical. So here it says if it's zero or one, like one if it rains tomorrow, and then zero if otherwise. So here are our, our predictors. If today's humidity is 9 a.m. and then if today's humidity is 3 p.m. and then whether or not it rained today. So different from what we've learned in the normal and what we've learned in the negative binomial, we are looking at this binary response variable for our response. Yeah, binary and categorical response variable. And different from, at least from what I've read so far, different from, or maybe it's the same, just I wasn't thought logistic version like that. So I guess what was cool for me is I've always known about, I'm skipping a little bit ahead. I've always known that it's supposed to be log odds. Like, so for this question, I just knew it from memory that it's supposed to be log odds. But then how he answered the question here that we have some constraints, like for pi, pi is supposed to be between zero and one. And then odds is only supposed to be positive, not negative. So he breaks it down why this question could not be A. Did you, is this something you're already familiar with? Like how the, the equation fits probability? Okay, we, are, we need uh, odds to be positive. We need it to make sense for probability when we transfer it to between zero and one. So that's why we are using log odds, not like, like this linking function. Did you have any comments or something you already knew or like? Yeah. It was something I already knew, but I tell you, you're right. It is one of the coolest things about this. It's like, almost like a magic trick. In some way, it's not a magic, but it's, it's really neat how you can like take this thing. Oh, I want to model this thing. So probability goes from zero to one, but I, how can I do that? And I don't think, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I don't think I would have ever come up with that by myself. <laughs> Maybe I would have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But now I always yeah. think in terms of log odds. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, like, what are the log odds? It's going to rain tomorrow. Oh, it's minus two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it tells us, okay, since we are doing our Y as um, binary, then let's look at Bernoulli, something we already know, because Bernoulli is binary. And then I think also being categorical goes with Bernoulli, like yes, no, categorical, or is there another one? So is it, we use Bernoulli because it's binary or because it's categorical or both? I guess it's like, I mean, Bernoulli's right, is just like, it's one trial, right? With like some probability attached to like the, you know, probability of success. So I think it's just that we're using Bernoulli, because like we're, I guess we're treating each data point, right? It's just like an individual trial, right? And then we're just, that's at least my understanding um, of why you, you could like do that. <laughs> okay. So that is the equation or distribution we are using for our Y. So we have to get distributions for our Y. We have to get distributions where I talked in the beginning, uh, yes, we need a distribution for y, for x1, x2, and x3. Yep. Yeah. So all here is going through, give some um, revision about odds and probability, then telling us why we chose what for what. Okay. And here, did you have any questions, any um, comments so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess here is trying to describe the, the general framework of interpreting logistic regression. Um, 
and then how you convert from log to odds using E. And these are the priors that we chose. Um, I'm just going through now. Did it give any reasons why you chose these as the as the priors? Yeah, let's see. Um, I don't know if Ron, you know. I, if I remember correctly, that they, um, I think they either say this or it's kind of implied that they just used um, our Stan Arms uninformative priors and they just kind of backfilled them in in the book. It seems like that's what it seems um, like. To me. You wouldn't otherwise pick such numbers. Yeah, out, like negative right? 1.4. Uh, yeah. Well, no, <laughs> here they do talk about why they picked negative 1.4 because that is the kind of the mean chance of rain, the mean log odds. So that's what they're explaining uh, right yeah. here. But Okay, um, so. So no, I guess they no, I guess in this in maybe it's a different part. There are times where they just use whatever the our stand arm gives them because you can ask what the priors you picked and then just say, oh, these are priors, just copy them back. But in this case, it looks like they do have some justification. Okay, it's twenty percent chance of rain. The log odds for that is minus one point four, so we'll use that as a mean. And then we want a good a good large spread from that, so they did give a large spread by using the point seven squared uh, standard deviation. Right, and he explains that here. He has to do the explanation. Yeah, yeah. You know, they'll compute the actual probability from that log odds. Um, yeah, yeah, they do. So it looks yeah. like, yeah, it looks like this whole section right here is just an explanation of that. But the idea was to try to cover the range of reasonable values, right? We know it's probably, you know, the overall, he, you already know the overall chance of rain is about 20%. So that should be, that's a good choice for initial mean. And then you want to spread the covers. You know, we don't really know, you know, what in any particular day the chance is. So he tries to cover a very large range with that. I think he turns mm -hmm. from, you know, um, what do you say? Yeah. Is, uh, from 0.06 to 50% chance, which I mean, I, to me, I would have even gotten wider, but yeah. But mm -hmm. that's only one standard deviation. So still, yeah, two, you know, still covered a, a large range. They're meant to be vague. You know, these are vague priors. Okay. Then we choose a distribution for X1. Um, so we are not choosing a distribution for X1, but we are choosing no, a distribution beta for, one. Beta for beta one, yeah. For beta one, which is our because the betas are okay, this one is our intercept, and this is the coefficient. Right. So yeah. I I I might be mixing it. Do you ever choose a coefficient for X1 or is always for the coefficients? No, yeah, distribution. Yeah, yeah, you so do you do choose a distribution for the x1 right that's your part of your likelihood and he, in this case that distribution is oh no you don't you're right no you don't well, you're, yeah. I'm sorry no you it's don't like, choose you a don't, distribution for x1 you don't choose, like given. for the predictors right that's like so you choose you choose yeah. like so like you have some data wrong. and then you're thinking like okay what what like what distribution do i think this data could have like been possibly generated right which is obviously not like a the one right answer there could be like multiple plausible distributions so we're thinking okay we're talking about like right like zeros and ones here we want to like you know calculate like the probability um so you know we think our data follows a Bernoulli distribution right that's our likelihood that's what we think the data could be generated on and then we since we're doing logistic regression we need to um we're trying to understand like the possible values like our parameters could take in this case like you know the intercepts at like beta zero and our slope coefficient beta one and so we're saying um you know, we're, we're putting like, right, as Ron said, like some like vague priors on like beta zero and beta one. And we think that these could like follow a normal distribution, right? We're just assuming that, you know, these values uh, can be modeled with a, like a normal distribution or rather our knowledge can be modeled with a normal distribution uh, for these okay. coefficients, but you never attach a, you never like a, attach a distribution to your predictors, even though, if, let's say, like, you know, you, let's say, I don't know, you plot your predictor, like, you, it could maybe follow some sort of distribution, right? And you, you should obviously look at that, but like, you're not assigning um, something like you did with like the likelihood function. Yeah, that's okay. correct. That's good. Good explanation, Robert. I misspoke before. I, I do think it's, a, I find it extremely useful once in a while just to take a step back and say, what is it we're trying to do here, right? I mean, we're trying to figure out in the end. Well, I guess there's different goals we could have. We could be trying to do prediction, whatever. But the the point of the the Bayesian statistical analysis itself is to find out the posterior distributions of the parameters, the slope and the intercept in this case. So we start out with some prior distribution of those parameters. That's what we have here. And then we're going to compute, simulate, whatever, to find the posterior distribution of those parameters. So that's what we're trying to do. 
I have okay. to always have to take a step back and remind myself of that because it's easy to get lost in the weeds of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so in your work, do you end up using like the normal distribution as your assumption for like your slopes a lot or? Um, so I guess this thing I was working on, I was using um, truncated normals uh, for some of my priors. Uh, so a truncated normal is literally just like a normal distribution and then you like cut it off at a certain point, mostly because okay. um, with the data you know, I was working with, I know it's all positive, right? So like with a normal, right, it can range from negative infinity to positive infinity. Obviously, like you could, you know, depending on where your mean is, it could, you know, not necessarily right range into negatives. But if like you have an idea that your data is positive, right, and continuous, I, you know, I, I I didn't use like a normal, right? Um, it, it's mostly what I, at least my understanding, my very very beginner understanding of all of this is more like the distributions are like at least for like the prior distributions are like ways to just like encode knowledge right and you're hoping to like find some distributional form that is able to model that efficiently as possible okay so here x1 is probability that no it's humidity at uh nine at so yeah. is exact humidity at uh, 9 a.m. Okay. So all this is specifying the priors. If you remember something here, uh, you can stop me, but I am going through now. So <laughs> forgive me. Okay, it's be 20,000. So this is a lot of what we usually do. We send it 20,000, and then we do our mark of chains. We're using four chains. Why always four? Is it like depending on your RAM of computer or? I don't actually know. <laughs> I, I guess like, I, you know, I don't yeah. know that either. <laughs> I think, um, I don't, you know what? That's an interesting question. Off the top of my head, I think four seems like a good number so you can see that they're all following each other, you know, you don't want one chain because you'll never know your chain is just out going off and not doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So with four, ch two chains would be sufficient, you would think, but well, maybe not, maybe both of them just happen to fall into the same, the same well. So, and then you got four cores on most processors, it's usually not more now, but when this thing started, mm -hmm. it was like four was pretty common. So maybe that's why, that's just, that's just yeah. guessing, <laughs> just guessing mm -hmm. up. I, I don't think there's yeah. like, yeah, I don't think there's like a special reason. Like, I feel like, yeah, what you're saying, guys, like, one probably not because like you could always have like one chain like it mixes well maybe like your other three don't or like there's some weirdness there but yeah i guess it's i don't know maybe more of a convention <laughs> you should look that mm -hmm. up <laughs> why do we use four chains <laughs> yeah i'm just looking yeah. it up too i don't get that that really pops out immediately it's maybe it's maybe it's like the 95 percent thing just kind of became a thing <laughs> or everybody yeah. else is using yeah. four. Already, I don't have any reason to use any more or less than four, so I'm going to do what everybody yeah. else did type of thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm thinking, as you said, it, it probably had to do with how long you want to wait for it to compute. So probably try it other ones. Like four that takes a good amount of time. and it's, it's more than one or two. So yeah. Yeah. So I wonder now, like if you have a more powerful computer, should you do higher? Does yeah. it really matter if you do higher? Well, it can matter like if you have more cores it would definitely finish faster so i would suggest yeah if you can i mean i haven't really thought hard about this but it seems to me if you can support eight chains in parallel might as well you definitely get done faster right do less per chain yeah. i guess there's a, a bit of diminishing returns because each of those chains has to do a tuning thing so it'd be worth looking at but yeah it's Right, because if you had, if you had like eighty processors, would you do eighty chains? But you probably wouldn't, because you'd be doing too much tuning. Yeah, right? and, and like then you probably like also, you'll be overfitting, right? Yeah. And you probably yeah, you probably aren't even like getting like is eighty chains like fundamentally better than like four chains? It's kind of like if I run this this chain for like I don't know a hundred thousand samples, right? Like is yeah. that any better than like twenty thousand? Like probably not. Um, mm -hmm. So I had to my manager. He was like, what if we just run this for more? I'm like, let me show you if we run this for more. It's like yeah. the, the number doesn't really change. Like changes like a little bit. That's probably just variation from the sampler. Right. <laughs> okay. So here it says um, beyond the re relationship between, we just chose to, to model 
the probability that that will rain tomorrow with humidity, right? It says beyond this relationship with rain and humidity, they want to confirm if our priors uh, reflects our standing of the overall chance of rain. So this is simulating 100 data sets. So is it the one where they end up drawing? Okay, I think it's going yeah. to be this. Yeah. And then you're supposed to put your other drawing in to see if it, it's okay, right? Like in yeah. the other chapters, there was like faint blue lines and a deep blue line. Is that what they are mm -hmm. trying to do here? Yeah. So like, it's just like prior predictive checks are just like a whole class of, you know, essentially you're just like plotting, right? Like you, you've done your MCMC sample samplings, right? You have all these samples of uh, parameter values, and then you want to essentially like, here, we're just fitting what, like uh, we're taking a hundred at random and we're like plotting it just to see like, do our choice of prior, does our choice of prior make sense before observing the data? And I think especially these are very powerful for like things like logistic regression where um, the link function, right? Uh, it messes with the, the space, right? So like if you can like obviously like visualize a, like a normal prior, right? On for like these coefficients, like if you visualize it, it like it's easy, it's unimodal, but you don't know what that actually happened, like how those priors, um, like how those priors interact when you apply the link function, because now we're talking about like a nonlinear space. So like this is where I, I especially think these are very powerful because now you can like actually see on the space of your data, like are my priors reasonable? And it seems like they are right. Um, there's like maybe but like a couple. How we, how we know that? So it causes following the logistic regression. I, I, it, it depends, right? Like, so like it it depends on like the problem the you're doing, you're yeah. using, right? Like I guess mm -hmm. as an example, let's say you were interested in modeling like height, and let's say uh, you had you chose some priors, right? Let's just say you chose them at random, and um, you do a prior predictive check, right? So we take our priors and we essentially um, we take our you know our priors um, and we create we generate data on the scale, but we generate data, right? That's on the scale of whatever outcome of interest in this case, it's height. And let's say in those prior predictive checks, your model is uh, creating values that are negative. That would clearly be wrong, right? Like there is no such mm -hmm. thing as like negative height. So it just gives mm -hmm. it, so again, it's more like, it just depends on like, what is reasonable depends on the problem you are interested in and like, uh, you know, the domain, right? So. Okay. I'm just saying it looks reasonable based on what the book is saying, but like, you know, depending on the problem you're working on, either that you should have some knowledge of that, or if you're like working with a domain expert, they will like tell you whether or not like this seems legit, legit or not. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what it's trying to do here because it talks about a quick data plot. So I think it's coming down. Why did we do this? Is this still checking our priors? Doing this to check the priors. Uh, we are. Data. So it's like we're just plotting our data, right? I think it's just the data we're plotting. Yeah, because this is just, yeah, humidity at 9 a.m. Yeah, weather. So we're just plotting the data. Um, Yeah, so this is, I think it's just like another way of, um, so like our priors, right? Like our choice of priors, like imply something about the data that we're interested in before seeing it. And then we're looking at the actual data uh, to see if like that makes sense, right? Um, and I mm -hmm. think they're saying, uh, okay, yeah. So it's, it's like saying uh, to the center, yeah, we cut that. And it's saying this observation is in sync with our prior understanding that rain and humidity are positively associated. Um, however, whereas our prior understanding left open the possibility that the probability of rain might near 100% as humidity levels max out, um, they're saying, like, at least in this data, the chance of rain at the highest humidity levels is like barely breaks 50%. Um, Which is like incongruent, right? If it's 100% humidity. Yeah, I mean, it could be, right? Like, I mean, it could just be that, you know. I no, mean, like well, in real life, when you measure 100% humidity, it should rain. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I mean, but it could also be like something, right? Just like the sample of data, right? Maybe it doesn't, okay. you know, fully capture it. So it, then we gave our, our model more information. I think the using this idea that uh, it only breaks 50%, ideally should be higher. So they updated the, I don't know if they already had some data. Oh, in. So, so it's not that, it's, um, it's not so much, I mean, I, at least from my reading of it, it's not that um, this is like necessarily a problem, like it could be, but it seems like right now, like our priors are like most more or less fine. This is just saying that when we, um, we now we don't want to look at the prior predictive uh, distribution, we now want to uh, look at the posterior uh, predictive solution. So this is now we uh, add in our observed data and then we look at, um, after observing this data, combining with our priors, um, what will our model, what type of data will our model now generate? And after uh, doing that, we can then look again to see like, okay, does this seem plausible, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is this another way of checking to again, like verify that our um, assumptions make sense? Okay. So we have 100 posterior plausible models for the probability of rain, versus yesterday's, the previous day's humidity level. And okay, right now, they are still just using one predictor, like the 9 a.m. So just one beta one and X one, okay. And then, so this is the credibility interval, credible intervals or no? Yeah, yep, that is. Is going over one, is that, is it okay for it to go over one? Uh, yeah, because right, we exponentiated it. Um, so I think okay. it's right now, now it's in terms of percentages. Okay. Um, it's a lot. So we are it's doing the, it's the, the odds. Log odds. Oh, it's the okay. odds, yeah. Sure. Now we're, yeah, now we're not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, even My odds. Bad. Oh, now you're on slightly. <laughs> okay, okay. So it's even odds. Well, more than 5% above that, but yeah. Okay. And now, as Ron said, we want to, we want to see what exactly we're trying to do. So we want to understand the relationship and then we, we got a, now he's using a value of 99% humidity and he's using that to predict. And then, okay, so when we're putting 99% at the top here, so how many, because it says head, so it's just a couple of them, but how many will be in this data frame? Like, how many predictions are we getting? Uh, it'd be the 20,000. Um, oh, okay. Because it's, right, we draw 20,000, essentially, right, parameter values for beta zero and beta one. And then we're just like, we're like saying, what was it, Perth, right? Uh, it's, mm -hmm. um, say it's at 99%, right? And then we're like seeing, okay, then we're like just computing predictions with our parameter values. And then um, that rain model one DF, um, that will just contain 20,000 predictions with our 20,000 parameter values. Okay. So there, so it's just like how, when we had the, the graphs, some of them had the S shape and some of them were out of whack. Um, Cause we have, like here, some of them had the S shape, some of them had the whack, were out of whack. Because here we have some of them which are zero and then some of them which are one. Like when we predicted, like Y is zero, Y is one. Yeah, it's, it's so would you like use the, whether you have a higher average of ones or have an average of zeros, how would you choose? Or you just choose one of them or like, I guess I'm a bit confused. Um, because when we did this, mm -hmm. we got for the first one says zero, second one says one, and we had yeah. there's twenty thousand of them. So are we going to average and see? Do we 
get something high closer to one or closer to zero or do you just pick one yeah i mean you just look at okay so our model like i mean i think they actually plot it yeah the posterior predictive model for the instance brain um they're essentially then just like plotting um how many times that our model predict one uh which words you know suggests rain um and how many times did it predict uh zero no rain um and that's just like look looking to see like what our model so is it, like that, doing so this is where this is what is doing here uh correct yeah okay so it's just literally just counting it up um of those twenty thousand um predictions like how many were ones how many were zeros or like you know you could do something like the mean right you could just do like something like mean of y or like mean of mm -hmm. you know mean, yeah mean of that column y um and that would give you like how many times like what per what percentage of predictions um were one what percent of predictions right would be zero if you just do one minus the hut yeah so he Basically, as you said, it uses all the 20,000 and then it tries to find the count. Yep. So I guess we are leaning towards one. So a common goal in classification analysis is to turn the observations of predicted probability of rain into the yes or no, okay. So we have a quiz yourself here. It says, suppose it's 99% humidity at 9 a.m. Based on the predictive model above, what will the binary classification look like? Will it rain or will it rain or not? I guess for everything we just said, it's more likely it would rain. Yeah. yeah I would say we should, we should definitely carry an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and we tier 10,800 of them call for rain. And here's a call mean. So I guess it's going through quite step by step and it's making sense so far. Did you feel like when you were going through this, was it like, oh, okay, this is something I know or it was something new for you? Um, I guess like the little bit of machine learning that I've done, it's like they, <laughs> they always like introduce logistic regressions. It's like a classification algorithm, which is like kind of not wholly true. Um, so like, I guess I like, had some more knowledge of like, this is what it does, right? Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same here. I mean, I definitely had been exposed to in Python, Bayesian logistic regression, but this uh, gives a much uh, nicer explanation. So I did learn a few interesting tidbits and a different perspective from this chapter. So I, did, I really like this chapter, by the way. I think it's really well done. Yep. Especially and this next the, part or this part where he talks about what the cut, this part here, we talked about the cutoff and, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever quite made that firm connection until I read this chapter. Yeah, because it's like also in like machine learning, it's always presented as like logistic regression is a classification algorithm, which is like not really logistic regression is it outputs probabilities, right? And then you as the analyst decide what is a one, what is a zero, right? I think in this example, we were saying that anything above 50%, right, we're going to classify as a one. That could be totally unreasonable, right? I mean, maybe, maybe right. it should be 40, but, yeah. uh, maybe it should be 70. Right, like here he says, I don't like getting wet, so I'm going to put it at 25% because I, I want to bring an umbrella because that gives me more chances of, you know, 75% chance of staying dry, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. At least. Yeah. So, like, if you do it yourself, you can, instead of just taking what the weatherman has 50% chance of rain, so it's like, okay, you should bring an umbrella, you can just say, oh. I don't yeah. want to be wet at all. I'll just that's give good. myself. That's actually a good point. The weathermen don't say it's going to rain. They say there is a percentage chance of rain. Yeah. That's their prediction. They don't go, oh, it's going to rain today because it was more yeah. than 50%. That would be kind of crazy, right? And I guess, like, <laughs> also the interesting thing, too, of, like, I don't know I was thinking about this. Like, if it was, you know, let's just say even though you're wrong, the cost of you bringing an umbrella with you is, like, 
neg like neg negligible, right? It's essentially zero. Like it's no cost to you if you bring an umbrella and it doesn't rain. But like I would imagine in like other scenarios, right? Let's say it's like it's like 54%. We think that's more likely. And then maybe you have to like do something. But if like whatever thing you have to do is like let's say imposes a lot of costs, then it like gets to the more like interesting question of like, do I do this thing or do I not mm -hmm. do this thing? Even if like the model is saying like 54% chance of something. I don't you know, that's <laughs> a great, that's a great point. Cause I think people don't realize how important that part of analysis is like you're doing all this modeling analysis. You can, you can get lost in the weeds. And at the end you have to say, what are we trying to do here? But if I'm trying to make a decision, then I need to really think about the decision and analysis phase. And there's like whole books just on that, like decision analysis mm -hmm. and how you make decisions based on what your models say. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it can affect how you do your modeling too, because maybe you want to use a different weight in your data, depending on what kind of decisions you're going to make. If it's like a life or death decision or whatever, right? So, but I think that's beyond yeah. the scope of this book, but it is yeah. other than this section here, I think, but it is an important topic. Mm -hmm. Cause with what you were saying that if your model only predicts 0 0.54 and you need at least 0 0.75, does it mean you start again, you get more data and then change your priors or like, what do you do? Like you need to make a decision and you've already set your cutoff. Right, that so that's what Robert was saying. You have to, you probably won't be able to get any more data. This might be it, even if you got more data, just some things are just inherently uncertain. No matter how much data you have, you'll just never be able to get that anything better than, oh, it's gonna be a 25% chance to rate. That's it, I'm sorry, that's all I got. And um, you have to make a decision based on, like he said, the costs the cost benefit analysis, so to speak, right? So like how much do I not like getting wet? How much do I hate carrying an umbrella? You, that has to weigh into your decision <laughs> where you put the cutoff. Okay. Yeah. So and if, if it, it was like also, a... Yeah. Think about if it was like a disease thing, right? Like, well, okay, what's yeah. the probability you have a disease, right? Now, whether you do a treatment or not, you don't say 50 cents the cutoff for treatment. It might be much lower. If the treatment is pretty low risk and has very little side effects, you might do that treatment even if there's like a 10 percent chance you have the disease just to make sure that you don't have it right especially mm -hmm. if the treatment would actually reveal more like a surgery or whatever well, on the other hand the treatment is very very risky uh, you want to be much more certain that you really have the disease before you take some life-altering procedure right so yeah but you you <laughs> just said it that before i had made the the decision that okay if it's 0 0.75 oh, yeah. or higher, I'm going to have the treatment. But now the data, and there's no more data, is only at 0 0.54. So at the end, you present it to the patient and then the person just chooses their choice. Like with all the, like make a decision with all the well, data you have. I guess it's, it's like, like the 0 0.54 though is, uh, it's because of the cutoff, right? So like if you put a larger cutoff, then like, Right, so like when we calculated the mean for Y, um, we were basing it off of a 50% cutoff. Um, I think if you like increased it, it might present like a new number, right? It might have like a different percentage. Actually, it would be lower uh, in this case, I, I, would, I would think. What, what do you mean? How, sure how would you, you change the cutoff yeah, here? The cut, this is not about cutoff, this is just the probability. Uh, yeah, the probability is 54% oh. is 54%. So whether you call that a yes or a no, it depends on your cutoff is what we're saying. Yeah, because right now my uh, cutoff is 0 0.75 or 75%. So technically, this is a no. Don't yeah, take it. It's a no. Yeah. But because it's like real life, you as a you present it to the patient and be like, okay, this is all the data we have. Like there's no more thing we have. All the data just gives us 54% of getting the disease. So. But you no, know, I mean, in real life, where things would be more complicated. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, we think there's about a 50% chance you might have this disease. Uh, we're not confident enough that we want to recommend this other one procedure, but we will do this other procedure. There maybe there is some other test we can do or some more invasive test that's worth doing. It's, you know, you know, I mean, that's kind of yeah. how you, I, there's always more complications, more branches you can go down than just two, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, yeah, I, so I, the point is that you I, have to I, think about the costs and, and benefits for whatever it is. It could be whether it's a carrying an umbrella or whatever it is, but yeah, you have to think about it. Like Robert said, if you don't mind carrying an umbrella, then you know it doesn't bother you. Maybe you think it looks cool. You might go on a day with a rain <laughs> chance, only 10%, whatever, right? So mm -hmm. 
Okay, it was because of what you said that there is no more data, and I get it now. Like well, there's no hypoth- more data. Hypothetical. Yeah. For this, like for this set of scenarios, but you might conduct another experiment, like maybe another test, another diagnostic test, and that will give you more data for you to yeah. make a decision. Yeah, that's correct. You could do that. And this would be your new priors, perhaps for that next stage of the analysis. You go, okay, let me see, try something else. Yeah. Because remember, although we're saying the probability is 54%, right, there's still some un- uncertainty about that that we, maybe we can narrow down. So where is our uncertainty in that? It's, in the, it's right, oh, sorry. Did you not, he, I think he did compute that somewhere in this chapter. Is it? Oh, yeah, with the, the credible most important thing. Yeah, yeah credible. I'm, so, I'm going to say that's one of the most important things you get out of this, right? So right now, it's quite, should I use it as it is, or we should convert it with the ease, like the 1.86, and it's still quite tight. So what is does it, it <laughs> well, is it? like if, it, if, if it, it, it's down here. Uh, this is the critical interval. So that's in terms of odds, it, right? Yeah here and then in terms of e so okay odds of brain reference double okay is it okay if i read this it says for every one percentage point increase in today's humidity there's an 80 percent chance so we how did we get the 80 percent because i thought we were doing like you just subtract 10, 90 minus 70. Um, so it's, sorry, say that again, <laughs> sorry. So they have here at 80%. Is it like you just subtract 90 minus 10? Uh, yeah, so it's like, it starts from the 10th percentile right to the 90th. And we're saying like between that, there's an 80% posterior chance that I'm not going to read that, but the log odds, you know, of rain increases somewhere okay. between that and that. Um, so. I don't think he I, does, I don't see him doing that interval in here for that particular question, like the 9 a.m. humidity. No, well, it, it, no, it is. So I, it's in the, um, yeah, it's in that little summary where he like exponentiates posterior interval rain model. That was about if the if there's an increase in today's. Wait, so are you thinking that this one is about the ninety nine percent one or? No, that's that's just with the right with beta one. Like this is the uncertainty in that parameter value. Okay. Um. But this okay, is like so just we, like an 80%. So like, yeah. I guess it's like, so we are technically like more uncertain, right? Because we're just getting like the 80% of like that distribution. So in that sense, you could actually say that even though that interval itself isn't particularly, it isn't like particularly wide. It, we're, uh, there actually is still though like uncertainty because like we're saying 80%, whereas let's say if you did like, an 85% credible interval, right? That oh, range you know would be more. I think wide. where we're getting lost in the weeds here is that this, um, the fundamental assumption here is that this is a Bernoulli process, right? So mm-hmm. no matter how much data you get, you're only ever going to get a probability estimate. You can get a really, really good estimate of that probability is, but if it's 30%, it's 30%. And, and you're not going to know whether it's going to rain tomorrow because we assumed it's a Bernoulli process. Yeah. There's some probability. Now, you could use a different model. You might say, well, wait a minute, we should be able to figure out better than that whether it's going to rain or, or not tomorrow based on complicated weather models and everything else rather than just the probability. So, and that will move that probably, in other words, that would move that probability because we get better data that way. No, is that right? I don't know. I'm having trouble thinking about this now. <laughs> You've confused me. <laughs> I'm having trouble thinking about it. No, I think that, that makes sense because like, even if let's say you knew what that let's say you knew exactly what the coefficient is, right? Like you will yeah. never be able to know with like certainty um, whether or not like the next observation would be like rain or not. Right. Um, I think like Richard McElroy puts it well, where it's like, he was talking about like, obviously the 
I think most base stuff starts with like beta binomial. Um, he said like, if you knew, let's say like binomial, right, has like pi, which is like probability of success on each trial. And let's say you just knew it. Let's just say for some phenomenon, it was 30%, right? And I know that, and that is definitely what pi is. You still wouldn't be able to know yeah, the exact know. distribution of it, right? Because you all you know is that it's 30%, but if I'm given a trial, all I know is that it's like 30% chance of success. And I could reasonably approximate a distribution, right, of like possible values, right, with this now that I know it's 30%, but I will never be able to uh, say with certainty on like any which trial, um, mm -hmm. whether or not it'd be a success or a failure. Yeah, because like the yeah, built into the oh, fundamental well, assumptions of our model, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, we keep going back. I'm, I'm still no, trying no, no, to, no. to, to <laughs> get it. It's yeah. Very good. Yeah. Okay. It's always helpful to talk of talk to things. <laughs> okay, so just with what we've been saying, basically we've done the model, but we have to evaluate it. And I think that's what we've been discussing. Okay, should we even start with Bernoulli? Like, is there something better? Like, all these are how fair, how wrong, how accurate. And we do the PP check. And what do you think of this PP check? Not bad. I mean, it seems, seems reasonable. Um, Right, we're saying that the proportion probability range uh, could be anywhere from what, like 13 ish to like 24, just kind of eyeballing mm -hmm. it. Um, I mean, it seems reasonable. We then see that we are indeed recovering the actual, so like that dark navy line is like what we actually observed. Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think, right, I, I don't want to be totally just lying if that's the case. Um, yeah the vertical line oh yes the observed proportion of days great that's also a good thing too it's like okay is our model actually recovering the uh you know let's say our, like our observed data right um could be like another thing as well um so it does seem reasonable right um but again like all of that stuff is more like depending on what you're working on whether or not mm -hmm. it's reasonable um but it looks, looks good to me <laughs> from the reading it and <laughs> my no knowledge about rain and weather <laughs> But we are trying to find if it will rain tomorrow. So is it like after, like today's the 28th, then you, tomorrow's 29th, then you, you check, did it rain on the 29th or maybe on the 30th, you then check, okay, did it rain? And did my model say it would rain? Is that like what it's saying? Uh, mm. I don't know. This is question. this is um, what this is is this is overall uh, draws, right? So for each, you can think of it. You can always think about this thing in different dimensions. But one way to think about it is that we have, I don't know how many how many posterior simulations do you do? Hundred thousand. Oh shoot! Sorry, I lied. Oh, you only picked a hundred. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we pulled out a hundred of the thousands, right? At random. Uh, these are simulated posterior data sets, right? And each mm -hmm. posterior data set contains uh, a, nest, a, sl a slope sample and an intercept slant sample, right? Mm -hmm. And from that, he calculates for each um, x value, each, what was the x value again? Um, it was 99. Humidity the at Humidity, nine. yeah. So we, for mm -hmm. each humidity in the data set, he computes the probability of rain and then just puts it all together, right, into that histogram there. And that's what you're looking at. Okay. So it's just in other words, for each, you can think about this way each of the simulated data sets is like a simulated world. And in that simulated world, what proportion of the data was there rain, right? And first, mm -hmm. and then the black line is the actual or the where the actual data was, right? Mm -hmm. Boy, it's hard, it's easy to not easy, it's not even easy to think about. I was gonna say it's easy to think about and hard to say, but it's actually not even that easy to think about because you have to, you know, think about all this data that's there, but um. <laughs> Let me try it this way, right? Suppose we just took one of the simulated posterior data sets, okay? So now we've got a single slope and a single intercept, right? A sample from the posterior, right? And now with that, I then compute for each of the, uh, for all the data predictors, right? I compute the proportional rain. And now I've got a simulated, a simulated 
answer whether it rained or not on that day, and then I can calculate the proportion. That's one of those blue bars. Mm -hmm. Or I'm sorry, okay. that's yeah, that's one of the components in, that goes into making those blue bars. I should say that's one of the counts that make that blue bar. So I might have been point two that particular realization. So that's going to go into that histogram column. Bin, or what, yeah. what you want to call it. I, I don't know if that I, was helpful. Uh, <laughs> but, I, I think I have to work through this again, just with a different question, not a rain, to, to really make sure I understand it. Well, I mean, that's the difference the now. With the examples, the which, I think will help. <laughs> that's what you keep telling me. Do the exercise. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> well, it really helps when you do it yourself. You're like, oh, how do you get that funny graph? Okay, let me think about it a bit. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm a bit confused on where we are now, but it's just... so he's talking about chosen classification cutoff, right? Okay, so he's now using just like normal Dipler, so it says mutate, call means. And then we are classifying this as one if probability is greater or equal to 0 0.5. And then we're checking from there. Okay, so the results for the first three days Okay, so first we did zero, zero. How come this is yes? Because we said class one, zero, class one. So what this is doing is for every single, um, I think what it's doing for every single prediction, right? But oh, no, it's already summarized it all though, hasn't it? There's only three. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, so it, 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 I'm kind of, yeah. It's really like 20,000, right? So, <laughs> yeah. And then it Wait. said that create this column plus one. And then if, if its probability is greater or equal to 0 0.5. Yes. Like, yeah. As numeric, is it rounding it off? Or? I don't know if you need that, but yeah. This is changing a Boolean into a number. Okay, oh, yeah, okay. Does. So just this zero is, to yeah. just zero changing one. Boolean to number. But I just don't get why this zero is a yes. Because I thought like all zeros are supposed to be no. Oh, is this um looking at rain is tomorrow that the is actual, the actual truth? Yeah, as the actual truth. Yeah, yeah so rain tomorrow is already in yeah. the data. That's the actual truth for that particular uh, humidity yeah. reading. <laughs> So he does yeah. it a bit above. If you were, if you go back to um, thirteen point three, simulating the posterior. Um, so that rain tomorrow. I'm looking at the code right now. Is um, he he like does the, you know, changes it okay. to um, yes and those. But rain tomorrow is it like because there's only one day, twenty eighth. Like today's twenty eighth, and tomorrow's twenty ninth, and then. The next day is 30th. So on 30th, you can know if it rained on the 29th. And that's just like a one yes or no. So how come we are having no, yes, no? Oh, these Do are you... all different days. These are all different these days. These are all that's different right. days. Yeah. yeah. This okay. is all the days in the data, right? So what was the humidity at 9 a.m.? It was 55. Uh, what did we compute? Okay, okay. Our predicted probability, 0.122. We used a cutoff of 50%, so that's a zero. Predicted. The actual was also no. Hey, we were right that day. Yay. Right, and then on we go. The third one, you can see we were wrong. <laughs> it actually did rain. We predicted it would it. Okay, so here is what he did. That okay, I guess. Yeah, the yeah. prediction. Yeah. And then we converted our um, logicals to numbers, and then we are on a roll. Thank you so much. Finally. Confusion matrix. Isn't it called another name than confusion matrix? Yeah, there is a, what is that? You're right, I think there is another name. Yeah. I, I forgot <laughs> it too. Uh, let's do confusion matrix. Uh, an error matrix. 
never heard of that, but maybe. <laughs> Another thing that is coming, coming to mind is like area under the curve. It's like, we do that a lot in like this yes or no thing. Yeah. It's like chai square table kind of, but not. Contrast uh, matrix or something like that? Maybe? Oh, there's like two by two. Yeah, two by two, contingency like, table. Contingency, yeah. contingency yeah. there yeah. it is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like, okay. yeah, like factor analysis. Um, yeah, so our model lake is not, it's not great. <laughs> or rather, it's not good for the days where it does rain. How do we know it's not good? Um, it's the like we we have calculating the sensitivity and probability. Okay, I have sensitivity and specificity. That's how we know it's not good. Well, it's good. Yeah. So it's like we like our overall classification rate is like it's good. It's like around eighty something, and we do a really good job at classifying days where it doesn't rain. But in days where it does, where it does rain, I think it's what well, we only calculate 14, 14 of them. Um, out of like a hundred something. So that's like not good, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, because it, it depends on what you want. In some cases, or, or there's no case, well, like even this case is bad. Like you're no days. No, okay, actually, no, you're, no, it, you're, no, no, it's good. Your no days are good because it's, uh, yeah, 803 over. But yeah, I know there are some cases where you, you pref prefer the higher no. yeah i mean it, it all depends right like again like it's all like depending on like what metric you care more about like do you care more about predicting days where it doesn't rain like maybe that is really what you care about the most and if you care about that the most then this model is very good but if let's say you care about accurately predicting days where it does rain your model's really bad because it's only predicting like 14 percent of them um correctly which is obviously below a coin flip so that's not good um <laughs> yeah yeah okay so just as what you said the fact that our model is bad at predicting rain is terrible news we can do better we can adjust the classification cutoff So decreasing the cutoff from 0 0.5 to 0 0.2. So meaning that it would be zero if it's less than 0 0.2. Yeah. But that's like a huge chunk of days where like 80%, like it's, 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 it's too high, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it could, it's, again, like, it all depends, right? Like, <laughs> if we, <laughs> right, like, because, right, we were just putting it at, at, like, 50%, and we're saying that, like, anything that has, um, like, 50% chance of raining, right, we're going to say, or above that, right, greater than equal to 50%, we're going to say it's rain. Otherwise, it's not, it's, just, it's not rain. And maybe that is, like, too high of a cutoff, right? Maybe we want it to be lower, um, which I think, I think Ron was actually saying that, too. It's, like, um, a little bit before it's where it's like, it really depends, you know, like, like, what is it that, like, what are your goals of this? And I think, right, it's like you lower it and then it's like 60 something percent and that's, you know, good. <laughs> um, yeah. And here it talks about using cost validation to make it better. And basically what we've been seeing, trading off between sensitivity and specificity. So yeah. like, in your decision, you have to check what you really want. And uh, we add more predictors, X2, X3, and it goes on to uh, choose our distributions for our new betas. We have only two minutes, but I guess what I will pause here. I guess if you have any questions or yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm fine with that. So I think it's why it's just extending the model. So yeah, like we're just adding more, more variables. Vectors. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that's more like, yeah, I don't even think we have to like necessarily belabor this one like a ton because it's just like we added more variables, right? Because we started with a really simple model and now we're like, have, we have probably more things that that relationship with the probability of raining or not. Um, mm-hmm. So, and yeah, this, think, le- uh, you go, Ron. I was just going to say, I think, you know, the key things are just using that logic, uh, logic link, right, to, to, do a, to do the regression, do a linear regression on something that's going to be a probability, which is kind of a cool thing. Everything else is kind of the same. The only other key point to bring away from this chapter is this idea of the sensitivity and specificity. Yeah, specific, yeah. How do you, easy for you to say? Spe- specificity. <laughs> Well, now you now can't say your best yet. <laughs> anyway, well, you know what I mean. Yeah. I always say probability of false alarm. That's easier. Um, yeah. <laughs> but in, to understand that little bit there, which we were just talking about, it, those are the key things to take away from that and how in, a, in this kind of model, when you're trying to make a prediction, you have to set that cutoff, right? And the exercises will ram that home. So I recommend, you know, go through at least one of like the hotel bookings one for example is kind of interesting i'm starting to work through it myself so um so yeah for me the hard part is i don't i don't speak r that well i especially tidy so i'm kind of just cut and pasting but <laughs> but that's okay you can do that right so yeah and uh it talks here about this leave one out which someone put a resource from andrew gelman in our group chat so I have to check that out too. We, right. we so talked this, about in, in yeah, chapter, chapter 10. 10. Yeah. yeah. It's a so way this is about the cost, cost validation? Well, it's a leave one out uh, validation, although it's actually a trick. It doesn't actually do the leave one out. It does some kind of trick, which I don't understand, but it's in that Gelman paper. But it, oh, okay. uh, it efficiently does it, I guess, in some way to c- compare models. Yeah. But that's, there's more of that in chapter 10. Um, you just want the higher number is the better one, and, long, and then you use the standard error to determine whether it's higher, what, how much higher is good enough, right? That's how you read something like that. Okay, so like this one is the better one. Right? No, that's the the worst one because it's got a lower zero. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, zero is better, higher than minus eighty. It's the expected log probability density, right? So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, oh, yeah, I did so- that wrong, didn't I? What is he saying here? Worse than rain model no, one. It's worse. Years. It's worse. So I see I got it backwards. Yeah. Because it's log. That's why. It's, I'm sorry. That's log. So minus 80 is a really small log. You know, e to the minus 80 is a really small number, right? Compared to the, it's, so it's, it's minus 80 log below that. So yeah. Right. So the rain model two is better. Yeah. By several mm-hmm. standard deviations. Anyway, I messed that up, but look in chapter 10. And I will too, because I realized I need to review that, review that again. Yeah, but I, I guess it just makes sense that like, with these things, you have to keep going back and forth and like, okay, what am I trying to achieve? What's my exactly. cutoff points? Yeah. Yeah. What do I want for specificity and sensitivity? And like, isn't that critical. like, isn't that like fudging your numbers? Because like, or you never change your data, you just change your cutoff point. So once you're yeah, changing I, the data, you're not fudging your numbers. I mean, in a way, you could even think of like a cutoff point as like, it's a prior, right? Like it kind of, it's an assumption, right? That's all like, even like what priors are, right? They're just assumptions about things. Obviously like, yeah, I could like, I could totally lie, right? I could put like some absurd cutoff value, right? To get like the thing I want. Um, but honestly, if I was like truly like wanting to like manipulate and like give a false value, I'd probably just manipulate the data, right? Cut out some outliers, you know? Uh, maybe slice a portion of the data off that I don't think really uh, comports with my hypothesis, right? Um, so I think, it, 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 I mean, for sure, right? Um, like I can say like, even like a project I was working on for work, like I had a, an assumption about like, oh, I think my data follows like a log normal. And like, I kept going with that. And then I like looked at like my, you know, prior and posterior predictive checks. I'm like, this is wrong. <laughs> this looks quite bad. <laughs> I'm like, that's not a good assumption. Um, so I like ended up choosing like an exponential uh, for like, cause it was like temporal based and it seemed like it was a good fit um, to like 
the problem I was working on. But that's like, it all depends, right? Like, it, especially like at least with the Bayesian workflow, it just it feels like you are caught, you have to, you can ignore, right, a lot of these things of like by checking stuff, or like you can manipulate and fudge your data, but I feel like it's a lot harder when it's like more in your face about like, hey, this could be wrong or like, <laughs> this doesn't look good. Maybe look at yeah. it. You obviously don't have to, but I think it's like, it's more in your face, if you, like compared to like, let's say like ML or uh, like frequent test, you know, framework, right? It's a bit more like mm -hmm. I, I fit the model and here are the numbers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trust so, me, I did it right. <laughs> <laughs> so once you don't change your data, it's, it's okay to change your priors. It's okay to oh yeah change your distribution. Yeah, like I, I, I really, because I've been reading more of the McElreath book and I think he, he puts it really well. It's like, you're not beholden to any of your choices, right? Like you have a choice of prior, maybe it doesn't make any sense. You are allowed to change it. You think your data follows like a certain distribution, but after thinking about it a bit more, um, you maybe think that there's a better distribution, right? That can like model your data. So you swap out your likelihood. Um, you mix and match different priors, right? To like try to get the thing that, you know, try to like better understand the problem that you're working on. Um, so it's not, I, I wouldn't say it's like necessarily like, right, like fudging, even like, I mean, all methods, right, have like their own hidden set of assumptions. I just think like, in the, at least in like the Bayesian framework, they're a lot more explicit. Like you could see them, like these are the priors I put. I'm not like hiding behind like, um, like assumptions and like many frequent test models or like frequent test tests that have like certain assumptions that aren't as visible, um, especially if you're not as familiar, right, with like the statistics, you know, the literature behind them and all of that. Yeah, so Ron recommended the hotel booking. So I guess that would be <laughs> something, as he always says, if you ask me questions in the chat, I will probably ask you something on the next Tuesday. I'll plan for next Tuesday. All right, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll try to yeah. get it done by then myself because I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to work through it myself. Yeah. Okay, so we are going to Naive Bayes, which is what they use a lot in ML. I guess they use logistic regression too, but I've been hearing a lot of Naive yeah. Bayes. I'd be curious, so, now that I like, yeah, now that I have like more, a bit more knowledge of Bayes, but like, okay, I kind of mm -hmm. understand what's going on. I'm actually very excited for this chapter because like you said, like it's always just like, Naive Bayes, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, it's something with Bayes theorem. The thing I don't know what that is, and now I'm like, oh, it actually, be, oh, I think it'd be like actually cool, like look at it in like a different light, because um, I know it's always just presented as a classification algorithm, and it's like, I don't know, Bayes theorem. You throw your data in it and it outputs something, yeah. and now I'll be like, oh, this makes more sense. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, that hopefully that's what I'll come away with. Read it. Yeah, I, I, okay. I haven't read it yet either, so I'm looking forward to that as well. I, I well, will. I know, said he will be, be here to do it, so. Yeah, I will be out though next week. Um, I do oh, okay. have, yeah, I've, I've stopped some work, um, unfortunately, we, but I'll we be- We can't get two RHs teachers. in the room at the same time. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> you guys are, you guys are, are yeah. fermions. We're, we're the same person. <laughs> you just, you know, we're moving really fast. <laughs> Aren't we all- Okay. <laughs> Literally. Uh, I, I, I already took seven minutes of your time. So oh, okay. just give me, give, give me three more minutes. Sure, sure. Sure. Okay. So, um, because I've been reading a lot about stable diffusion, DALI, because it seems like the thing in 2022, if you do anything <laughs> machine learning, like, like someone will ask you, what do you think about DALI or stable diffusion? G, is it GT or GP? GPT. Yeah. GPT. Yeah. And then open AI. I, I use a lot of, um, the, the it's called um kill bots and i think it, it's based on the writing one the gpt3 mm -hmm. i think so do they do any of this or like all of them are like black box stuff like is there a way for you to actually know what they are doing or is all black box because i know some of the code is open but like will it be as open as this where like anyone who has a basic understanding of stats can understand or is like you still can't really understand what's going on. My understanding would be no, 
but it's also like I, I know there is like research and like trying to get more like understanding about what a machine learning model like how it outputs a prediction right like all of that stuff so I know there's research on that I don't know like the direction of it in the sense of like are they actually making progress? Also, this, I don't know. I also feel like at a certain point when you have a model that has like millions or billions or trillions of parameters, right? Like all of these stuff, like stable diffusion and GPT or Dolly, like you tend not to care as much about the meaning of the parameters or like how the model arrived at a certain decision. You more so care about like, is it correct? Um, like I use GitHub Copilot when I'm writing Python, for instance, right? I really enjoy it. I think it's really cool. Um, I don't necessarily care how, I mean, I'd be curious to see like, okay, how does it actually know that, right? That's like, my brain is like, I'm curious about that, but I more so care. It's like, is it recommending me something that's right? Um, and does it look good, right? Like, was this, would this be code that I would write? Is it just like a pile of, of crap? And I don't, I will not accept this suggestion. Um, like I could write something better, right? Um, mm -hmm. so I don't know. I mean, it's obviously much different, right? Than like the even, or even like frequency test methods, which like you get an interpretable, you get interpretable parameters, right? Like we were doing logistic regression. Um, like we can, we can literally interpret what beta one means. Whereas like, you know, you have these things like massive neural nets. You don't really know, like, why. It's just like it output a prediction. Um, but I guess also don't fully quote me on that because I wouldn't be shocked if there is like, if what I'm saying is like kind of wrong and there is more like research into interpretability. Mm -hmm. Although I feel like, again, like my, my prior on this, if you will, um, would be that, um, the ML community is not like as concerned about like interpretability, right? Because they're more so concerned about can I make a machine like do this thing accurately? And, and so long as it satisfies that criteria, I don't necessarily care about the interpretability of my parameters. I just care more about the predictive accuracy. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Because like, I mean, I am um, right now, trying to get my thesis topic and there's like so many things in ML and then NLP and I'm like I want to do something with Bayesian like what do I do what's the cool thing what's the new thing what is relevant to me and like what you said like I'm never going to get there for interpretability so if I look at something about is it doing what it's supposed to do that yeah. might be a better and I do know there are, there's a, a one well-known guy in the Bayesian community. He has been working on implementing like Bayesian methods into machine learning. Um, mm. He was on a podcast, honestly, like, let me find it. It's this one podcast I've been listening to um, called uh, Learning Bayesian Statistics. It's uh, by mm. this guy, um, Alex Andorra. He is a co-founder of PyMC Labs. Um, I really like it. It's just kind of nice just to, you know, have something in your ears and like it mm -hmm. feels educational, you know, or, or whatever, right? Um, <laughs> I, also, I do like, that you know, with Richard. Uh, like the, yeah. yeah, his YouTube stuff. So I just... Um, I, I don't think I actually fully listened to this one. Um, I mean, I'll, I'm just going to put it in the chat uh, right now. But... I really like this podcast. I think it's good because it also, you get like a lot of different perspectives of people who like use Bayesian, you know, methods in their work and like struggles they face um, and whatnot. Um, but this guy, it looks like he, his name's Kevin Murphy. I think he's actually very well known in the machine learning community. Um, I think he has also has like a recent book that came out. Anyway. Um, Those guys, I think they often he, use, they often use variational methods, right? Is that what your understanding is? Because there's so many variables, oh, there's so many, yeah. especially like I, a neural net or something like that, it's almost yeah. impossible. So he's variational. I just know that like he was at least talking more about, I, I would need to read like the entire, like what, I didn't listen to the full, uh, this full episode, but I do remember that it was just like, he was talking about like Bayesian methods in machine learning, but yeah, like it, it could be what you're saying, Ron, that it could be like variational methods. Cause yeah, like you have, all these parameters. So like, mm -hmm. I think it was something with the weights actually that he might've yeah, mentioned. The yeah. Um, 
But I think the key I, I would idea that. there is instead of just predicting individual weights, you predict the distributions of weights. Yes. Which then yes. you can use to, when you make your predictions, you average over all those weights. Yeah. Appropriately, and you get better. In the end, you get better predictions, which is what you're trying to get to, right? Yeah. So I think actually, I think that is probably exactly <laughs> what this one was about, which is still like interesting too, right? Because it's like mm -hmm. now you get a possible oh, it's kind of edge stuff. I think. I mean. Um. Yeah. To me, is, I think it is. No, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um. But it, yeah, also. This is a really cool podcast that I'm listening to, so I, yeah. I enjoy it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> like, really, last question, <laughs> if you have to go. So, do you think, like, there are problems now? Because I know, like, life problems are complex, but are there still problems which can be solved just using interpretable base stuff? Or now, it's like, oh, we just use the machine learning? I think it's tons, especially, like, like I work... Erica is, you know, our company sells an NLP product. Uh, they're called Basis Tech. It's, you know, we sell an NLP product like uh, corporate and government clients. Um, so obviously NLP, machine learning, you know, don't have to blame at that point. But like I, I work as a data analyst on the sales operations team. Um, so like I've been doing like a little bit of Bayesian work for like some of our estimates, like nothing like, <laughs> but like, you know, it, I enjoy it. It's fun. Um, you when you're I think especially when you're trying to explain things to people like executives or you know other people like decision makers right that, that can be like in academia or industry I think it'd be really hard pressed to put like here's a random forest here is uh the uh you know here are the most important values right the the, the relative importance right those plots of uh, my predictors in this and uh you know, like they're going to be like, what does this mean? Whereas I feel like in other, a lot of, I mean, so much work I think is like more than just like ML, right? It all depends on what you're trying to do. If you care more about like understanding a problem um, and you want to be able to like interpret it, then you probably want to use like a frequentist or like a Bayesian method or something like that. Whereas if you're really more so care about like prediction, whereas maybe you're like, you know, easy one, like, I care about predicting or recommending TV shows that are relevant to like this group of people. You don't necessarily care a whole ton about like why the model does these things. I mean, you may have like ideas, right? Like it's not totally a black box. You probably have like some notion of what it's doing, but um, you care more about right, like the predictive accuracy. I think it's more thing that I've been thinking about just like even for my career is like, what are the types of problems you want to like work on? I thought for mm -hmm. a long time, I wanted to do more machine learning stuff. And as I've been doing more of the Bayesian stuff, I think like, I just enjoy this more, um, which isn't a knock against ML. It's just that I just find this more satisfying when I'm like working mm -hmm. on a problem where I can use like Bayesian methods compared to machine learning, which I always felt, and this is like my own experience, not a, at all an indictment of the field, because it's obviously does a lot of useful things. And I always feel like how it was always taught to me is like, here's some data, here's some model, throw in the data, maybe you do some pre-processing on it, uh, you get some predictions and uh, you know you tune some hyperparameters. I don't know what those hyperparameters really mean in a like intuitive sense. I don't add more trees, add regularization, you get a better prediction. And that's kind of how I always felt it was presented to me. Um, obviously a lot of stuff again you know, ML is very useful. Um, but don't forget that this is ML, right? I mean, just because you're calling it Bayesian data analysis, it's, if you're trying, you know, it is a form of ML, right? Machine learning. Machine learning is not just neural networks. It's not just trees. It's not just whatever. It's all these different methods of taking mm -hmm. taking your data and learning something from it. So, yeah, I learn, guess I'm like, no, sorry, I, learning a predictive model from it. That's yeah, I, I mean, I guess like I, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe, <laughs> I would say that definition is maybe a bit too broad for me, but like, yeah, I mean, you are fundamentally right. I guess like in statistics, you are trying to create a model that looks yeah. like data. I, I agree with you. I will put this more on yeah. the statistics. Yeah. yeah. Like I know there's, there's no. I'm not like, saying that line. all statistics is machine learning, but I'm saying that machine learning can be done with some fun, what you might think of as fundamental or old fashioned statistics techniques or Bayesian statistics techniques can be used for a form of machine learning, statistical learning, right? I mean, that book, Introduction to Statistical Learning, yeah. is a very popular book and it talks about all these statistical learning methods, which are essentially machine learning methods, right? That's fair. Yeah. yeah.
No, I'm not, in other words, let me put it differently. Logistic regression, that's a form of machine learning if it's used for that, right? If you're using it to, to that makes sense. And, make, yeah. and, make, and make predictions. Now, it's also not machine learning if you're using it, if you care more about what those parameters are, if you're more interested in the parametric understanding, right? That's fair. Mm -hmm. In yeah. other words, in that case, you probably try to understand the model and you're trying to understand what does this mean and what can we do to, to change things in that way, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's fair. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so, so much. Almost 20 minutes of your time, but I think this one was good too. Like as Ron is always saying, like, why are we doing this? Why, how are we getting <laughs> there? And I think I needed to decompress and like understand, okay, the whole thing of, yeah, we, we do this book, what else like what do we do but as you said like i have to understand what types of problems do i want to do do i and that that keeps you whether you are in statistical learning or you're in ml it depends on what types of problems you want to yeah do. yeah thank you so much yeah you no know, it's always helpful to hash these things up because that's how you learn i think more than anything else yeah. Except doing the exercises. That's the other one. <laughs> <laughs> I do need to do them too. <laughs> All right. We'll see you guys right, next good. week then. Yep. Okay. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.